Hi, welcome to today's webinar on compressed air. My name is Steve Kosky. All of PGE's seminars and webinars are sponsored in part by the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. We work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations you learn in our events are consistent across all of our individual programs and services. Now, this slide was up while we were waiting to get started, but if you could mark it again so everyone gets a chance, uh, use the markup tools on the upper left side of your screen and give me a feel for what your typical operating compressor horsepower is and what types of compressors you're using on your systems. You can click on the pencil and just make a mark. All right, so some oil flooded screws, some oil free screws. Uh, and medium to large systems there. Oh, there's some reciprocating compressors too. Okay. All right, we'll make sure we touch on all that. First, let's talk about why we like compressed air, why compressed air is so great. It is extremely versatile. It can push, pull, carry, cool, stir, dry, and disappear. It's hard to think of something you probably couldn't do with compressed air. It's really simple to connect. It won't shock you. It works in wet and corrosive locations. And compressed air actuators are inexpensive, light and small. And one of the best things about compressed air is spills are self-cleaning. They just go away. In fact, compressed air is so wonderful that 10% of all electricity generated in the United States goes to an air compressor, which is kind of an astonishingly, astonishingly large fraction. And 7 in 10 industrial sites uh, have compressed air systems. But compressed air is also terrible. It's very, one of the reasons it's terrible is because it's very compressible, which is obvious. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's uh, take, a, grab a gallon of air just in front of you, just room air with your hands, and now imagine squishing that gallon down to a pint of air, which would give you about an 8 to 1 compression, and it would be about 100 PSI, 100 pounds per square inch. Now in our thought experiment, we're not going to let any heat get out. What is the temperature of your pint of air? So using the same markup tools, go ahead and write on the page somewhere your guess at how hot you think this pint of air would be. We squished a gallon down to a pint. We'll give you a second to think about that and then scratch it up on the screen there somewhere. Any answers? 50 degrees, 75 degrees Celsius. Two hundred Fahrenheit. There we go. All right. Amazingly enough, if we really did this, our pint of air would be 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which just seems unbelievably hot. When we look around all of our compressed air piping and our tanks and our hoses and everything, they're not 500 degrees. And why not? And that's because we've thrown away the heat of compression in oil coolers, intercoolers, and after coolers. 85% of our compressor power gets turned into heat. So that means a 100 horsepower compressor makes 85 horsepower of heat and 15 horsepower of usable air power. Now that's a best case situation. It might only be making 10 or 5 or 3 horsepower of usable air power if it's operating in a less efficient mode. So one way to think of an air compressor is 
a fancy heater that makes some compressed air as a byproduct. To get 15 horsepower of air power out to the shop floor for a year, we can spend $50,000 on electricity to run an air compressor, or if we could do that same 15 horsepower worth of work with an electric motor, it would only cost us about $7,500. So what's the lesson here? Compressed air is very expensive, and we want to use it carefully, and we want to make it efficiently. So let's look at a list of energy saving concepts. This is a generic energy saving concepts list uh, in no particular order. And let's just talk through these briefly. Uh, minimize loads. So minimizing loads in a compressed air situation would be uh, using less compressed air. Uh, using your best part load option would be using uh, a load unload type control system or a variable speed compressor uh, for a part load trim compressor. Uh, turning it off would include uh, shutting down a system when it's not needed. Minimizing pressure drops, uh, if we have some bad actors, your filters or dryers or piping or other situations which are you know, forcing us to operate at a higher pressure, we'd want to correct those problems and minimize our pressure drop. And oftentimes, number four can lead to number five. If we minimize our pressure drops, we can optimize our pressure settings. It'll let us go back to the compressor room and reduce our pressure settings there. Uh, keeping idling time to a minimum. Some compressors are set in a mode that instead of shutting off, they'll just idle forever. And that obviously, there's a fair amount of power used when you're idling equipment. And if we can keep that to a minimum, that'll help save us energy. The right technology. Oftentimes, there's several different ways to make compressed air or to dry compressed air or filter it. And we want to use uh, the appropriate technology for our system and for our needs. Use the least amount of power. Uh, use the right size equipment. Oversized equipment is generally the biggest problem. Uh, oversized equipment use, tends to use a lot more power than necessary. If we have undersized equipment, it might not do the job. We might not have enough compressed air to uh, keep our plant or system operating properly. Remove barriers to more efficient set points. Uh, sometimes there's a, a bad actor out there, a pressure sensitive user or something that's forcing us to use less efficient set points. And if we can fix that or clean that up somehow, it'll let us use more efficient set points back in the control room and use less power. And making the most of your controls. Sometimes we already have controls that we're just not using the, we're not getting our money's worth out of them. We're using a less efficient mode or the settings are, are not ideal. And so we're going to refer back to this list uh, several more times, so keep those concepts in mind, and we'll have to kind of pick which, which of these apply to the case studies. So let's go through a handful of upgrade case studies. And the first one is a shop air situation. And this shop air system was built with a 75 horsepower oil flooded screw compressor rated at 330 CFM, but some logging showed that this guy was only averaging 31% capacity, so not, not highly loaded, not making a lot of air. And it was matched, or I should say not matched, with a heated desiccant dryer that was rated for 550 SCFM. But you'll notice that the compressor only makes 330 CFM. So this just totally smacks of uh, somebody was looking to buy equipment and somebody said, hey, I've got this other equipment just sitting here. It's used. You know, I can give it to you for pennies on the dollar. So they got this equipment probably very cheap and it doesn't match. The other thing you'll notice is that there are no purge controls on the dryer. So this dryer is just continually regenerating 
regardless of how much compressed air is uh, pushed through it, how much moisture load is on the dryer. Now, when we use inlet modulation control, we don't get a very good part load performance out of these compressors. In fact, at this 30%-ish capacity where this compressor was operating, it's going to use, uh, you know, somewhere 75 or 80 percent power, even though it's only making 31 percent air. So that's not very ideal. Uh, the compressor had automatic an automatic control mode, which potentially could have used uh, a load unload type control, but it didn't, even though it was in automatic. Now, we already talked a little bit about purge saving controls. This compressor didn't have them, but uh, many of your systems, many of your desiccant dryers will have purge saving controls. Now, one thing about purge saving controls is they all depend on some sort of a dew point or moisture load sensor. And these sensors, uh, they don't last forever. And the first thing that happens when these sensors die is you have to bypass the sensor, essentially, and put it in. You've got to take it out of the purge saving mode. And that's just to keep the dryer functioning. And so now it goes into a mode where it just regenerates constantly, regardless of moisture load. And you can see here's a few pictures of, of different dryer panels where they've bypassed the moisture load control. And often what happens when the sensor dies is you flip it, you flip the moisture load control off, and then it gets forgot about. Because the dryer still works, but what it forces is it forces the compressor to make more air to satisfy this purge demand. And because the dryer works, nobody really bothers about it again. All right, we're back in business. But obviously the best thing to do is to get that dew point sensor serviced or get it replaced and get these guys back in that moisture saving mode, uh, the purge saving mode. Now, on this shop air system, the single biggest load was actually the purge for the desiccant dryer. Uh, the second biggest load was just your normal users, pneumatic tools, shop use, miscellaneous use, like you'd see in a maintenance shop. They also had a handful of timer drains. And this total, these timer drains ended up totaling about 10% of their total compressed air usage. And you've probably seen these timer drains. They have two dials on them. One dial sets how long it will blow, and the other dial sets uh, how many minutes between blows. And those, uh, you know, if set up improperly, can use a sizable chunk of your compressed air or just blow more compressed air than is necessary. Oddly enough, this compressed air system had almost no leaks, very tight system. And their electrical operating cost was $22,000 a year to run this 75 horsepower compressor. Now, one upgrade approach they could have taken was to install a tank, operate that screw compressor in a load-unload mode, uh, purchase some purge-saving controls for the dryer, and basically just kind of fix what they already had there. But they decided that, look, this system was just designed wrong from the beginning. We're going to design it right, and we're just going to replace this equipment. So they ended up buying two 15-horsepower screw compressors that use load-unload control. Um, that was the customer's preference. They liked the screw compressors. Screw compressors uh, have a, a longer life and a little less maintenance requirement than a reciprocating compressor. But the really great thing about reciprocating, about small reciprocating compressors in a shop application, is that they have a perfect part load curve. In other words, if you need 50% air, they use exactly 50% power. If you need 10% air, they use 10% power because they just run 10% of the time and they shut off, you know, most commonly using a start-stop control method. 
And that is great for small systems, and I would encourage you to, you know, use reciprocating compressors on small shop-type air systems for that reason. Uh, they installed quite a large tank. You know, there's a rule of thumb that says you want your, for a load-unload -load compressor on an oil-flooded screw, you want five gallons of tank volume per trim compressor CFM production. So these 50, these 15 horsepower screw compressors make about 55 CFM. So really, uh, 300 gallons of tank would have been sufficient. But they ended up purchasing this very large tank. And, and basically, they did that so that instead of these screw compressors remaining on all the time, but just loading and unloading, with, with enough tank, they will actually shut, time out and shut down very quickly and actually be on and off. They almost have an on-off type operation with sufficient tank volume. You can't do that on larger systems, but on a system like this, you can do that. They also bought no air loss drains and replaced all their timer drains. So these drains just drain out the air, uh, just drain out the, the liquid water and don't blow compressed air. And they looked around and they said, well, man, all this compressed air that we're using, it's all in the shop that's, you know, heated to at least 50 plus degrees in the winter. So we don't need a desiccant dryer providing, you know, minus 40 dew point air. A refrigerated dryer is going to be just fine for, for shop air tools. And so this whole project, uh, you know, is fairly expensive. It was a $55,000 sticker price by the time they had all this equipment purchased and installed. But it brought their operating cost way down and saved them about $15,000 a year. So that's a several year payback project and the utility participated with that and helped pay some of that cost. And so it brought it back, you know, to a very attractive one to two year range for this customer. So that's kind of a wonderful success story. So now let's use our markup tools and let's think about this guy, the 75 horse screw compressor that was kind of replaced with two 15 horse screw compressors and a refrigerated dryer. And just check off or mark or underline whatever, whatever you feel like, which energy saving concepts are at play in this example. And we'll give you a few seconds to chew on that. Yep, use your best part load option. They definitely had their new system set up to be very efficient at part load because those, with that large tank, those screw compressors were going to be able to shut down and be off a lot of the time. I keep, yep, keep idling time to a minimum, part of that one. Yeah, and right size equipment, yeah, that's a very big one. They, they had the wrong size equipment to begin with. And the other one, yeah, there we go, number seven, the right technology. Their, their dryer was the wrong technology. They did not need a desiccant dryer. And that was costing them, that was their single biggest air use was the dryer. And remove barriers to more efficient set points, yep. All right, let's move to a palletizing compressed air system. So this is a little 30 horsepower oil flooded screw and it's dedicated to a palletizing operation. This compressor has a handoff auto switch that had always been kept in hand since anyone can remember. They just run it in hand when, when the system's on. And that forces the compressor to stay in a modulation mode and won't let it unload. They also had a heatless desiccant dryer, and when we showed up, we actually found the purge air to the dryer had been valved off for at least three weeks since the last service visit, but they had had no operational problems out on the pelletizing equipment. You'll also notice that their, their discharge pressure on the compressor here is, you know, just a touch under 130 PSI, so 
fairly high discharge pressure. The users on this equipment was primarily this palletizing equipment. Another, the second biggest user was the dryer purge. Now the heatless desiccant dryer will use about 14% of its rated capacity. And if it doesn't have purge controls, it'll use that all the time. Uh, of course, once, I, once we open the valve on that purge line. And then they had leaks, like most systems do. And this cost about $11,600 a year to operate this compressor in electrical billing. So they, these guys weren't interested in spending money, but they did want to you know, get a bunch of savings they could by just tuning up the system. So they put the compressor in automatic mode and put a big sign there so that all the operators know, do not operate in hand, auto only. And they reduced the load and unload pressure settings to match the needs of the palletizing equipment. They really didn't need anywhere near 130 PSI to keep the palletizing operation working fine. Down uh, above 90 PSI was sufficient to keep the users happy. And this really didn't cost them any capital money. It just cost some operator time. We had to get the manual out and read through things and uh, get it adjusted. And this ended, ended up saving these guys about $3,300 per year for, you know, a few hours worth of investigation work and setup and a little bit of testing. Now, the site is also considering installing a $3,000 refrigerated dryer. Um, they're still debating that. They, they, the palletizer is on a refrigerated, in a ref refrigerated space, and so normally you would use a desiccant dryer there to make sure they don't see moisture in the lines. But they're, they're wondering if they need that, and they could get about another $1,000 a year of savings if they go to a refrigerated dryer. So they were initially on our on our inlet modulation curve, our not so good curve, uh, kind of operating in the middle of the compressor's capacity range, and then they moved to uh, a load on load, a pretty good load on load operation, probably closer to this case one lower line. So they, you know, kind of here's kind of the range of their potential energy savings and go from you know, maybe 85% power down to about 60% power, which was that $3,300 a year. Now, you'll notice that there's a couple different lines here for load unload. Load unload can be really pretty good. This case one is, you know, pretty good performance. And case two is not so good. Um, a screw compressor's uh, an oil flooded screw compressor's power when it's unloaded is determined by the sump pressure, the oil separator or sump. And some oil separators uh, blow down to a low pressure, maybe even atmospheric pressure, or maybe uh, 20 to 30 psi, which would give us, you know, a fairly good unloaded power situation, maybe down here in the 20 to 30 percent unloaded power range. But other compressors uh, blow down either very slowly or they blow, don't blow down to a very low pressure. They might, they might be misadjusted or they might only blow down to maybe 50 PSI or 60 PSI sump pressure. And that gives us kind of this not so good part load curve, this green uh, load unload case two situation. So, and the other thing that can impact the load unload efficiency is how much tank volume you have. If you don't have very much tank volume, that's going to kind of penalize your part load efficiency on a load unload uh, situation. And I think we already mentioned our five gallon per CFM rule of thumb is what we like. We don't, you don't always have to have a full five gallons, but five gallons will give you a nice part load of efficiency. So thinking back on this 30 horse palletizing compressor where they moved from inlet modulation to load unload and adjusted some settings, what concepts did they take advantage of to achieve their energy savings? Go ahead and use your tools in the upper left-hand corner to 
make a check or an X or make a mark on what concepts these guys used. Yep, definitely number five, optimize pressure settings. That was a big one, getting away from 130 pounds and down closer to, you know, something a little bit above 90 pounds to keep their users happy. And, yeah, make the most of your controls. That's right. They had this control. They just weren't, they had the ability to use load-unload controls. They just didn't really know it. And so getting that in, in service was a big hitter, too. All right, let's move on to a textile processing case. Uh, this is a 225-horse variable speed oil-flooded screw compressor, and it runs, you know, anywhere between 40 and 100 percent load during the operating week. They have a second compressor, but it rarely operates, but sometimes they will max out their primary compressor and bring that second compressor on for a little bit. The discharge pressure setting on this main compressor was set at 110 PSI, and they had a really nice cycling refrigerated dryer. So these cycling refrigerated dryers, they kind of use energy in proportion to the moisture load that's being sent to the dryer. So they're set up very well there. And they had a flow controller, uh, which was maintaining a 90 PSI pressure set point downstream. Now a flow controller is kind of a misnomer. Flow, flow controller is basically a, a fancy pressure regulator, which allows the compressors to discharge at a higher pressure, but supply a very steady uh, pressure downstream from this valve. And they had a lot of tank volume, so plenty of tank volume. Their users was this textile processing equipment, which was not particularly pressure sensitive, and 85 to 95 pounds and all this equipment would work just fine. And one of the, another one of their main users was many, many compressed air leaks. Uh, during breaks and lunch periods, when we'd walk out on the production floor, it would just hiss everywhere, and you could find, it was easy to find these leaks. You didn't need a, an expensive uh, leak sniffer, ultrasonic test uh, detector. You could just go listen for them and find them. And they had historically used these uh, barbed hose fittings to connect up their tubing and connect up plastic tubing. And these fittings are uh, famous for having like a high initial leak rate and a very high uh, leak rate at five and ten years. And so in general, you know, we don't like these barbed hose fitting connections. And they were spending about $86,000 a year to operate this compressor system. Now with the variable speed system, they're already set up very well. They already have a very good part load curve part load performance. So if they're basically to, you know, go from, you know, here, say 80% capacity down to, uh, you know, say 60% capacity, they're already set up very well to save uh, power over here, you know. I would save them a decent chunk of power. And that's exactly what they did. They went after all these leaking tubing fittings. and they actually found some some of these users were really trouble prone in a particular area and they just they got away from the hose barb fittings and installed a you know a double ferrule type fitting which is much less leak prone uh, they also did an experiment where they bypassed this flow controller they said well what if we just open the valve around this flow controller and reduce our compressor set point is that going to impact our operation negatively is our equipment going to perform erratically? And they found that the equipment performed fine. And so they were ultimately able to reduce that 110 pounds down to 94 pounds. And there's a rule of thumb for screw compressors, which says that for every 2 PSI of pressure reduction, you get 1% of compressor power savings. So between the, you know, the leak repair and the pressure settings, they ended up saving about $22,000 a year. So thinking back on these guys, already set up with a variable speed compressor and they do some leak repair 
and they uh, bypass a flow controller, what are the principles in play here for energy savings? Go ahead and mark those up with the tools in the upper left of your screen. Yeah, I think that's it. Optimize your pressure settings, minimize minimize your loads. In this case, the load was was leak load. So whoever was dark blue, thank you, you nailed it. Now this is a larger system. This is a beverage bottling system. And we're not going to talk about their supply side other than it's very big, about 4,000 horsepower, very efficient controls. So their part load situation was great, which means if they were able to reduce air use, that their power use would just fall right along with it, kind of like our, our last example. Their uh, partial list of their users, they had uh, five air-powered vibrators, which were assisting some uh, lids to move around some packaging equipment. And these totaled about 50 standard SCFM, standard cubic feet per minute, on average. They had a bunch of palletizing and packaging equipment that used vacuum generation equipment that uh, totaled about 284 SCFM of air use. And they had nine Vortex cabinet coolers that averaged about 117 SCFM. And they had uh, leaks inside of a bunch of their packaging lines, and they knew about these leaks. And they were just always leaking. So the upgrades they went after was, first of all, on these uh, electric vibrators, they replaced these guys with electric-powered vibrators. And these guys use 10% power. And people are like, 10% power? How is that even possible? Well, this brings us back to our you know, fundamental inefficiency of compressed air, where the compressor makes 85% heat and about 15% air power. So if we do it with electricity directly, we get massive, massive energy savings. And so that saved all 50 SCFM there. They also went through and did kind of a wholesale upgrade of the vacuum generators inside the packaging and palletizing equipment. And they put in a new style that uh, shuts off the compressed air supply to the vacuum generator rather than shutting off the vacuum, which is uh, always what we want to do. We want to kill the air, not the vacuum. And these generators also had an auto shutoff feature where when they pulled a fairly deep vacuum, that would automatically shut off the airflow. And this netted them about 144 SCFM of savings, which was about 51% of the savings uh, for all those vacuum generators. On their vortex coolers in these cabinets, they found uh, that these coolers were not performing properly. They were not giving the, pressure, the temperature reduction that they should have. And so they cleaned and repaired the guts of these coolers and got them to actually you know, discharge the cold air that they were supposed to. And then they added some thermostat controls so that they weren't in cooling all the time. And this netted them this cut almost half of the compressed air consumption out of those vortex coolers in the cabinets. Now, they potentially could have done something else. They could have moved to a non-compressed air powered uh, cabinet coolers, and there are several options there. And then on the packaging lines that had leaks inside them, they just installed automatic isolation valves so that when the packaging line went down, the compressed air would shut off automatically, so you didn't have to, you know, hope that the operator remembered to go close a valve. It would just shut down on its own. So by if we add up all these, they had a 373 SCFM of flow reduction. And they had great compressor controls and great dryer controls so that this flow reduction translated directly to, you know, utility bill savings and saved them about $28,000 a year on a project that cost only about $31,000. So that's, that's pretty good economics there. So our energy saving concepts for these guys, this is the bottling plant. What ones do you think were in play? There's kind of a handful here, one main one. 
Go ahead and mark those up with your uh, your pencil up on the upper left. Yep, turn it off. They had some loads that they could just shut down, like the cabinet coolers. You know, when it the thermostats allowed those to stop blowing air when the cabinet reached temperature. Any other ideas? Yeah, minimize loads. I think this is primarily a load reduction project where they got some stuff away from compressed air and the stuff that used compressed air, they used a better technology and got it using less compressed air. All right, now off to our auto parts manufacturer. These guys had three 500 horsepower centrifugal compressors and two operate during the production week. The one is base loaded and the other was typically blowing off. And these are just using local controls on their control panels. On the weekends, they only needed one compressor and it was also typically blowing off. And they had they had excellent heated dryers with uh, active purge controls, so no problems on their dryers. A, a centrifugal compressor you will use an inlet valve to reduce capacity uh, to somewhere between maybe 65 and 80 percent capacity. It, it can only reduce capacity a little bit using the inlet valve. And then to reduce capacity any further, it has to open a blow-off valve and basically just throw away the compressed air. It has to make, you know, it has to make this much compressed air, and then it just throws it away with this blow-off valve. So they had been operating one compressor up here at full load, and then they had been operating their second trim compressor somewhere down in this range. Uh, blowing off a fair amount of the time. Some users that these guys had were a handful of bag houses with a net air consumption of 175 SCFM. And these bags were constantly cleaning. They were constantly pulsing whenever the system was on. And they also had a one particularly pressure sensitive user that was fed by a very long one inch pipe. And when this guy needed air, he couldn't get enough pressure. And so it, due to this long run, it was forcing about 115 PSI pressure setting back in the compressor room to keep this one user happy. And the, obviously bigger system, we're going to have bigger dollars, about $378,000 a year to run these compressors. So the upgrades they went after on the supply side was they replaced all the compressor control panels and they added a supervisory control system that could reach in and grab control of the new panels and operate the compressors. And this new control system would modulate all operating compressors simultaneously. And then the other big trick was it would test, it would periodically test and see if it could shut down a, the second compressor. So instead of, you know, one at full power and the other blowing off air, it operated both compressors more in this region. And so that allowed both compressors to reduce power. And they didn't know it, but they were actually able to uh, unload and then shut down the second compressor a significant amount of time that they didn't think was possible during you know lulls in production and lulls in air usage, that second compressor would unload and if the, the period was long enough, it would actually shut that compressor off. So a control system can have some wonderful advantages in, in centrifugal compressor situations. On the demand side, they added some differential pressure bag house controls to keep the bag houses from cleaning continuously. It basically looks at the pressure drop across the filter bags and when that pressure drop is low, meaning that the bags are clean, it stops pulsing them with compressed air. And this netted them 
110 SCFM of savings. The other thing it does is it extends the life of your uh, of your bags because you're not just banging away on them continuously. And then for this pressure sensitive user that had the undersized line, they just installed a two inch line in parallel with the existing one inch line that just totally eliminated that big pressure drop out to that user. Now in, with centrifugals, we don't get our full, our rule of thumb 2% uh, well, we don't get 1% power per 2 PSI pressure reduction with centrifugals because they, they're not a positive displacement compressor. They work a little differently. There is some there is some power savings there, but it's not that big. But what it really does is it reduces artificial demand. And artificial demand is just extra air consumption by leaks and unregulated users when our pressure is higher than it needs to be. Uh, so if they had a leak out on their main distribution line, it would just leak more at 115 pounds than it would at 102 pounds. So even on centrifugal compressors, there might not be the obvious savings, but there's definitely savings due to reduced artificial demand if we can lower our pressures. And this saved them about $74,000 a year. And it was, uh, it was a moderately expensive project, $178,000. And you know, over half of that was the cost of the new control panels and the master control system. They don't like to give those away, but they can definitely pay for themselves in short order. And with a little bit of utility participation, the simple payback was made you know, even more attractive to this customer. So thinking back on these, this centrifugal compressor operation with some bag house control upgrades and install, adding another two inch line to a pressure sensitive user, what generic energy saving principles were in play for these guys? Go ahead and uh, scribble these up, mark them up with your annotation tools. Yep, minimize the pressure drop. Yep, that's what our piping upgrade did. Minimizing the load on the bag house controls, that's exactly what they did. There's another one or two out there in play. I think those last ones, yeah, and yeah, that's right. Minimizing the pressure drop did remove the barrier to more efficient set points. Um, they uh, they were able to optimize their pressure settings. They were able to keep the idling time to a minimum on, you know, via that new control system. And I don't know if this one's really at play. Make the most of your controls, because they had to kind of get new controls. So may maybe the new controls, we could think of that as a right technology, you know, upgrading our control technology. And uh, maybe turning it off, getting that second compressor off when it wasn't needed. So a lot of, a lot of different principles are potentially the correct answer there. Oh, it, and using your best part load option because the the new control system was modulating uh, two comp was modulating both compressors simultaneously, which works really well with centrifugal compressors. But actually, with screw compressors, we don't want to do that. We want one compressor to be the only trim compressor at a given time with with screw compressors. So. So compressed air is kind of a universe unto itself. There's, it's so versatile, it's used for so many things that it can be a little overwhelming, but you don't have to figure all this out on your own. Uh, PGE and Energy Trust customers have some free energy services available to them, uh, either by phone or on site. You can contact Darren Spencer here the second uh, line there, or you can visit the website address, address here, and someone will contact you. And if you're not a PGE customer, uh, a lot of utilities in the Northwest have technical and financial assistance available to help you identify projects on your system and then to help, uh, help fund some of the cost. 
So to our summary, what is our take home message from today? Compressed air is really cool, but it's fundamentally inefficient. Remember that 85% of our compressor's power, we end up throwing away as heat. We don't, we don't always throw it away, but quite often it, it, it's, it's not helpful to us and it ends up being thrown away. So we want to use compressed air carefully and we want to make it efficiently. And with that, I'll turn it over to Beth for questions. Thank you, Steve. Before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I wanted to remind you all that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat, and I will ask them of Steve. And now I'd like to get to our first question, which is, Steve, in the solutions that you showed in the textile with the textile company case study, uh, we found that VSD compressors are not friends of pressure flow controllers. Is this correct? You don't, yeah, you, there are some people that would argue that, yeah, you should always have a pressure flow controller or an intermediate controller, that those are always a good idea. But I generally don't see a lot of additional savings and sometimes no additional savings for adding a flow controller if we have a variable speed compressor in play because they have a fairly smooth pressure control. You know, they can adjust speed finely to keep uh, the pressure in range. Now, it could potentially be appropriate for very, very large systems where running uh, running it at a few PSI higher than necessary, you know, on a four or 5,000 horsepower system can end up costing you quite a bit of extra artificial demand. So there a flow controller could, could pay for itself. But sometimes uh, my general feeling is on a variable speed situation, especially with a single compressor, you probably don't need a flow controller. Thanks, Steve. And the next question we have is, um, do food processors have to use oil-free compressors? There's a lot of food processors. It, it seems to be a, quite a mix. There's a lot of food processors that are using oil-free, and it seems to be you know, a bit of a trend towards that for new installations. But there are many food processors using oil flooded screw compressors also. Oh, and I didn't touch on this, so let me take a little sidestep here and talk about oil free screw compressors. The traditional method of controlling an oil free screw compressor is load unload control. And this works really well because there is no oil separation sump on an oil-free compressor. So when the compressor unloads, it, its power drops almost instantly to the unloaded power. And because it drops so quickly, we don't have to worry about having really large volumes of tank to use load-unload control. So I would, if you have a load-unload oil-free compressor, you're probably in a pretty good part load situation right now already. Uh, there are some manufacturers offering variable speed oil-free compressors, and those can potentially be more efficient down at low loads. You know, if you start getting below 50% capacity, those can save a little bit of energy. And at very low loads, they will definitely save you some energy. But up in the, you know, middle and upper capacity ranges, there's really not any efficiency gains there. And it might even be worse. Uh, you know, at full load than a than just a fixed bead oil-free compressor. I'm not sure. I got off topic there, and I forgot where I was. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, another question we have is: I have a regenerative dryer. How do I know if I could use a refrigerated dryer instead? So you need a regenerative dryer, and you need minus 40 dew point air. Basically, if you're going to use air in a refrigerated room, you know, if you're going to use air in a 35 or 40 degree cooler to run packaging equipment, or if you're using air outside, uh, your pipe, let's say your piping's all outside, well, then you better have the dry air or else you're going to have moisture condensing in the winter and freezing in your pipes. Um, the other industries that commonly use 
desiccant dryers or regenerative dryers are uh, microchips, uh, high-tech industries, uh, medical device manufacturing, uh, and there may be some others. Um, but if you're using your air in, you know, a conditioned space in a in a shop that you know is not going to get below 50 degrees, or you know, in a in a conditioned building, you can probably just use a refrigerated dryer. And refrigerated dryers are great because they use very little power compared to desiccant dryers. Well, they're, and they cost less. They're less expensive to purchase and less expensive to operate than desiccant dryers. So yeah, if you're using it inside and you're not doing something that's you know very very sensitive to you know a minute amount of uh, water vapor, it's actually you know the water would be in a gaseous form. It's you know steam in the air. As long as your product isn't sensitive to that, then you can use a refrigerated dryer. Thanks, Steve. Um, how much tank volume is needed for load unload control? Yeah, that's back to our are five gallons per CFM of trim compressor capacity. So if you have just one compressor, well, that's easy. You know, look up the CFM capacity of that. And if it's, uh, say, it's 400 CFM, and we multiply that by five gallons, then that would give us about a 2,000-gallon uh, target volume for our tank for load-unload control. Now, we don't have to do that for every compressor, though. It's only our trim compressor. So if I have a 400 and a 400 and a 400 CFM compressor, I only have to size that tank for one of those compressors. So it would still just be the the 2,000 gallon tank and not, I don't have to add up the CFM from all of the compressors. Great, and I um, think possibly related question we have is, how does the receiving tank size affect a VFD controlled compressor? With variable speed compressors, they don't need as much tank volume in general, but where they do need, where you do need to make sure you install tank volume is when they're sequencing. If you're bringing on or off other compressors, if you have very little tank volume and you try and shut off a compressor, then the variable speed compressor, you know, has to react very quickly to a, you know, a radically changing pressure. And you might get bad uh, sequence changes if you don't have enough tank volume. So you probably don't need the full five gallons per CFM, but you should still have, uh, you know, maybe two gallons per CFM to ensure that you're going to get good sequencing when you bring on and off compressors and your sequencing isn't going to get fooled by super fast changing pressures. Thanks, Steve. And I think this is our last question so far. Um, should I buy two VFD compressors? Uh, some people do. I've had customers purchase two variable speed compressors because they were adamant that they have to rotate, you know, I want this compressor on for two weeks and then I must have the other compressor on for two weeks and I want to go back and forth. And if they, if you feel strongly enough about that, then you can have two variable speed compressors. But typically you don't need that. You just need one compressor that can kind of stay in the trim mode and uh, give you good part load performance. So I would say generally not. One would do it. Thank you, Steve. That was the last question. Oh, whoops, sorry, looks like we have one more question. Um, if a receiving tank has only one pipe for feeding it and no discharge pipe, how would it affect the compressor? Yeah, if there's only one connection, that's what we call side streaming the tank. And you can side stream a tank and get some of the same benefit. Um, you want to make sure you're using a generously sized pipe, though. Um, there are some piping rules of thumb, and you want to make sure you use, you know, you air towards the larger pipe connecting that, because the air is going to have to uh, go into the tank when our compressor is loaded, let's say, and we're pressurizing the tank, and then the air is going to have to turn around and go back out of that tank through that same pipe. So we need to not be skimping on pipe size there. Um, 
the big disadvantage, well, it's not a big disadvantage, but it is a disadvantage of side streaming a tank, is that it's not going to serve as very much of a moisture knockout. The normal way you pipe a tank, particularly a tank that's before a filter, a dryer, is you put the air in the bottom of the tank or the you know, kind of the side mm -hmm. of the tank near the bottom, and then you take it out of the side of the tank near the top of the tank. And that allows the air to have some residence time in there for any, uh, any liquid water particles to settle out, or any oil. If the coalescing element in the compressor has a problem or the compressor is passing some oil, that tank will knock out a lot of that water and oil and kind of help your filters and dryers that are downstream of that. And you won't get as much of that benefit if the tank is side-streamed. But a side-stream tank is definitely better than no tank. And it still serves a lot of the same functions as far as compressor sequencing and allowing load and load control. Thank you, Steve. That was the last question, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And now I'd like to draw your